Okay. Um, still, when the curtain rises on Act One, Scene Two, and yes, I know that. Whoa, what just happened there? Everything still okay? Yeah. Uh, yes, I know that in Shakespeare's time, uh, there there was no curtain rising on the next scene because uh, plays were generally presented without divisions between uh, one scene and another, but. In modern terms, uh, when the curtain rises on Act One, Scene Two, we are immediately uh, greeted with a very different uh, uh, visual uh, tone um, from what we uh, saw in the last scene. Uh, act One, Scene One was um, dark, outdoors, uh, uh, creepy, uh, uh, endless, infinite, you know, just a few people. Curtain rises on 1.2, and we are. Uh, Indoors, brightly lit, huge crowd, fancy throne room. Uh, the scene begins with an official speech by uh, the king, uh, the new king, uh, Hamlet's uncle Claudius. Um, now, uh, most of what he says here in his initial speech, um, lines uh, 1 through uh, 38 uh, in 1.2, uh, is, is reminding the audience of... Uh, stuff from the uh, original legend that they might have forgotten or, or might not have known. Um, in other words, that uh, since the last king, since Hamlet Sr.'s uh, death, um, his brother, uh, for some reason, uh, rather than, than his son, Prince Hamlet, uh, has become king. Uh, and not only that, but he uh, nearly immediately uh, married the queen. Uh, Queen Gertrude, uh, uh, Hamlet's mom, um, uh, explaining this uh, around line eight. Um, Therefore, our sometime sister, now our queen, the imperial jointress to this warlike state, have we as twere with a defeated joy, with an auspicious and a dropping eye, with mirth in funeral and with dirge in marriage, in equal scale weighing delight and dole taken to wife, uh, nor have we here in Barger better wisdoms, which have freely gone with this affair along for all our thanks. Um, the short version of that would be, uh, I know it was kind of weird that I immediately married my dead brother's widow, um, but, you know, none of you made a big deal out of it, so thanks for uh, going along with that. And in uh, uh, the way he is putting all this, um, we see uh, Claudius's obsession, at least when he's speaking publicly, um, his obsession with some idea of balance, right? Um, you know, everything is half this and half that, mirth and funeral, dirge and marriage, equal scale weighing delight and dole. Um, uh, or even before that, uh, we with wisest sorrow think on him together with remembrance uh, of ourselves. It would be uh, uh, unwise uh, to to be sad about my poor dead brother for too long. Um, it uh, it befitted uh, it us befitted to bear our hearts in grief, our whole kingdom to be contracted in one brow of woe. Yet so far hath discretion fought with nature. For a while it was appropriate for us to be sad, um, but now it is appropriate for us to stop being sad. Um, so what, what, what we're seeing in King Claudius, at least the public face of King Claudius, is this uh, uh, obsession with um, doing uh, uh, what is appropriate or what is uh, balanced. Uh, you know, you, you immediately get the sense that um, uh, if he were alive today, he'd be one of these guys who was a, a little too proud of his common sense. Um, he moves from there uh, to uh, yet another update on the beef with uh, Norway, um, holds up a, a letter from uh, young Fortinbras, uh, uh, letting us know that... Uh, he hath, uh, he hath not failed to pester us with message importing the surrender of those lands lost by his father and around line 23. Um, he, though there isn't a stage direction, um, the, the phrase uh, so much for him is uh, often uh, taken as indicating that Claudius tears up the letter uh, to great applause uh, from the assembled, uh, making a big show of not being scared of Norway and, you know, because I'm now king, you don't have to be scared of Norway either. Um, in fact, uh, he's got a plan. Uh, we have here writ to Norway, uncle of young Fortinbras. So he's writing to the king of Norway, 
uh, whose name is apparently Norway, that's convenient, um, who, impotent and bedrid, scarcely hears of this his nephew's purpose. Uh, in other words, the king of uh, uh, Norway is old. He doesn't want war. He probably doesn't know what young Fortinbras is up to. So I'm going to tell his uncle on it. I'm writing to the king of Norway. He'll put a stop to this uh, young Fortinbras uh, business. Um, so we've got uh, even more parallelism, right? In, the, in 1.1, it was established that here in Denmark and over there in Norway, we've got um, you know, two dead kings and living sons of the, the, the of the same name, uh, dead King Hamlet and living Prince Hamlet here in Denmark, dead uh, King Fortinbras and uh, living Prince Fortinbras over there in Norway. And in both these cases, it is the brother uh, that has uh, become king uh, instead of the son. Now, in the case of the Fortinbras family, um, it, it, that makes a bit more sense, right? If it was many, many years ago, that uh, king, uh, we find out exactly how many years ago, much later in the play, but uh, at this point, we figure it was, you know, a long time ago. If it was many years ago that King Hamlet killed King Fortinbras, um, it makes sense that the brother uh, would have become king uh, uh, instead of the son. The son was presumably quite young. As far as why did that happen here in Denmark? Um, well, it was the Middle Ages, you know. Um, I mean, that's usually the, the question that people have at this point in the play. How come Prince Hamlet didn't become king automatically upon his, his father's death? Clearly, he's not a, a child. Um, well, uh, we hear um, over the course of the next couple of pages that he was away at college at the time. And uh, back in the Middle Ages, things were a little loosey-goosey like that. If the rightful heir is very far away and by the time he gets back into town, uh, the, the dead king's brother has the crown on and the army in front of him, then, oh, well, looks like he's king. Um, so I guess the, uh, the people uh, went along with that also, uh, in addition to going along with the marriage. Anyway, uh, he gives a, uh, the letter to Norway, the king of Norway, to Cornelius and Voltamond, um, who, who uh, haste themselves to uh, deliver it. Um, uh, the king then turns to uh, a couple of more characters that Shakespeare himself invented uh, and added to the legend. Uh, uh, Polonius, who is uh, the king's, uh, um, well, I guess in modern terms, chief of staff, uh, his, his, his right-hand man, his, uh, his smithers, basically. Uh, Claudius's smithers is this guy named Polonius, um, and Polonius has a, a son named Laertes. Um, uh, now it's it's established in lines uh, forty eight through uh, forty fifty or so. Um, uh, the king says to Laertes that the head is not more native to the heart, the hand more instrumental to the mouth than is the throne of Denmark to thy father. Establishing that this guy Polonius has served uh, the Danish throne for a long, long time. So uh, so we know that he's not. Uh, a new guy that Claudius brought in, um, but that he uh, presumably served uh, Hamlet's father, uh, served uh, King Hamlet as well. Uh, and since he appears to be quite old, maybe even the king before that, he's had the job forever. And his son Laertes uh, wants uh, to go back to college in France. Uh, what he's asking for is your leave in favor to return to France from whence though willingly I came to Denmark to show my duty in your coronation, uh, blah, 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 that duty done, thoughts and wishes bend again towards France. Um, and so the, the king gives Laertes permission to go back to college uh, in France. We'll see him uh, uh, packing up and saying goodbye to his family in uh, the next scene, Act 1, Scene 3, so more on him in a bit. Um, that brief uh, those, those two brief speeches by Laertes and Polonius are just to introduce those two new characters to the audience, since unlike uh, uh, the prince and the, the uncle and the, the uh, queen uh, slash mom and the, the ghost, um, these are new characters who were not in the original legend. Uh, but all that time, so for the first uh, you know, two solid pages uh, text-wise of this scene, we're not paying too much attention 
to this speech where the king rips up the letter and to whoever this Laertes guys is wanting to uh, go back to school in France, right? That whole time we're paying attention to this dude uh, way over on the side of the stage, uh, you know, presumably wearing all black, sighing, you know, uh, not paying attention to anything else, looking real depressed, perhaps eyes cast skyward, um, right? Because remember, it's written as a play, not a movie. So you can see everyone who's on stage. Um, it's not like now where maybe the camera doesn't show us uh, in, in, a, in a film of the play where the camera might not show us Hamlet until uh, his first line. Um, you know, it, he would have been on the stage just not saying anything yet um, for the, these two pages, but by long-standing tradition, even at the premiere, um, everyone would have known that the depressed-looking guy uh, uh, in all black is Prince Hamlet, and so we're, we've got our eyes on him. We're waiting for him to say something. He finally does at line 65. Um, uh, the king turns his attention uh, to him, and now my cousin Hamlet and my son. Yes, of course, Prince Hamlet is Claudius's uh, nephew, uh, but in Shakespeare's time, cousin was just used generally for any relative, uh, like kinsman. Now my cousin Hamlet and my son, Hamlet responds uh, under his breath uh, with this famous first line, a little more than kin and less than kind. Uh, in other words, uh, 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 more closely related to me than you should be, right? A little more than kin. You're my uh, uncle, but now you're also my stepdad because you married my mom. Um, and less than kind, uh, uh, meaning even though you are doubly closely related to me, uh, you are nothing like me, and more importantly, nothing like uh, my late father was. Um the king asks, how is it that the clouds still hang on you? Hamlet responds, this time not under his breath, responds to the king directly, not so, my lord, I am too much in the sun, uh, punning rather obviously on uh, S-U-N and S-O-N, the, the thing in the sky that gives us light, and sun as in uh, a male child, meaning um, the, the reason I am still sad uh, is, is that I am my father's son, and so of course I am still sad. Um, it, his, his mom steps in. Um, Do not forever with thy veiled lids seek for thy noble father in the dust. Thou knowest tis common, all that lives must die. Hamlet responds, I, madam, it is, long pause, common. Um, uh, letting that word uh, hang in the air. So, so common meaning both statistically normal and also to call someone common, especially a woman, uh, meant that she was uh, of low morals. So Hamlet is um, calling his mom a slut here, basically, in a way that, that apparently goes over her head. So um, the first three things this guy says, this, this uh, black-wearing, uh, depressed-looking prince, are, are, are double meanings, are, are puns, um, uh, uh, witticisms. Uh, almost. Um, and uh, the the next thing that's said to him, if it be, why seems it so particular with thee? His mom asks, uh, the, the, his double meaning in the previous line having eluded her. Uh, and boy, did she really uh, set him up uh, there because he leaps on, as he will do, this word seems and makes great meaning out of it. Uh, seems, madam, he responds, Nay, it is, I know not, seems. Tis not alone my inky cloak, good mother, nor customary suits of solemn black, nor windy suspiration of forced breath, no, nor the fruitful river in the eye, nor the dejected havior of the visage, together with all forms, moods, shapes of grief that can denote me truly. These indeed seem for their actions that a man might play. But I have that within which patheseth show these but the trappings and the suits of woe. Um, the point of this being, uh, uh, you know, I barely know what the word seems means. You know, with me, uh, what you see is what you get. What's on the outside matches uh, what's on the inside. And what's on the outside uh, is a bunch of BS anyway, right? Um, 
Tis not alone my inky cloak, good mother, and our customary suits of solemn black, windy desperation of forced breath, fruitful uh, river in the eye. In other words, um, uh, wearing black, sighing, uh, windy desperation of forced breath, uh, the fruitful river in the eye, tears, the dejected havior of the visage, a depressed expression on your face. Um, all of the ways, in other words, that you would know someone is sad by looking at them, right? Um, just as you would look at someone and assume, okay, well, he's wearing a Yankees hat, he must like the Yankees. He's wearing a Nirvana t-shirt, he must like Nirvana. Um, you would look at someone who was crying and sighing and wearing all black and say, that person must be sad. Um, uh Hamlet lists them all, um, but then objects that these indeed seem, for they are actions that a man might play. I have that within which passeth show. Um, in other words, anything you see on the outside could be faked. Um, you know, the person who looks sad might just be pretending to be sad. Uh, what someone really loves or believes or feels um, is on is on the inside and that can't be seen right everything that is visual everything that is observable might be fake you know probably it isn't you know I don't know why uh, someone who hates the Yankees would be wearing a, a Yankees hat but I guess it's possible that that's the case maybe for some reason he's just trying to trick us into thinking he likes the Yankees um, you know there's something that that you assume based on looking at someone might not be real now, uh, I'm, I'm belaboring this because it's very gutsy on Shakespeare's part because look at what was going on for the first few minutes of this scene, of, of 1.2. Uh, the king made that big speech about the wedding, about the beef with Norway, uh, the letter to Voltamont and Cornelius, Laertes going back to school, the whole time where going, yeah, 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 get to the, the depressed guy wearing black in the corner. You know, he's who I came to see. Right, the whole time we know as soon as the curtain goes up, that's Hamlet, the 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 depressed looking guy wearing all black. Right, that's how we know it's him. And then as soon as he finally talks, he calls BS on the very way that we knew that Hamlet was Hamlet, saying, "Oh, all of that stuff doesn't matter at all. Anything visually observable is fake." These indeed seem for their actions that a man might play, dismissing anything that can be played, can be acted. But wait a minute, this is a play. We're watching a play right now. You know, if anything that can be acted, can be played, can be faked is uh, worthless BS, then what is the point of watching this play that we're watching right now? Um, uh, this is, uh, you know, I mean, I don't know whether the word meta theatrical uh, existed uh, in, in in Shakespeare's time. Um, yeah, probably not. I mean, it, if it did, it would have been because Shakespeare himself made it up, but I don't recall seeing it in any of his works. But today we would certainly call this meta theatrical. It's a, uh, it's something that reminds us right, that what we're watching is a play. Uh, Hamlet, when he finally speaks, makes fun of uh, uh, the, the, the idea of um, what's on the outside mattering. Um, but of course, that is the essence of theatrical representation, right? All of the stuff he lists and dismisses as crap, wearing black, sighing, crying, are the ways that we know Hamlet is Hamlet. Um, we can't see what's on the inside, and indeed, he is a fictional character. There is nothing on the inside. There is no such person as Hamlet, Prince of Denmark, right? He, that, that's not really, we would know if we're looking at the stage, that's not really Hamlet, the Prince of Denmark. It is an actor pretending to be Hamlet, the Prince of Denmark, reading lines uh, written by William Shakespeare. There, there is no such thing as what's on the inside a fictional character is necessarily two-dimensional. Um, reminding us of this is, is a very kind of inside baseball, very gutsy joke on uh, Shakespeare's part. Um, you know, he's, he's messing with uh, what we would call 
suspension of disbelief, right? You're not supposed to remind the audience uh, that the play is only a play or that the, in modern terms, that the movie is only a movie, right? Having someone look right at the camera and say, it's only a movie is something that might happen in a comedy, but this is a, a, a tragedy, a serious drama. Normally, you, uh, the idea of having the main character kind of remind the audience that it's fake is not something that would get done in a uh, in something serious as opposed to something comedic. Um, uh, so it's gutsy on on that front, and it's also I feel, and many others have felt, Shakespeare himself. throwing down uh, the gauntlet to himself, challenging himself, how real can I make a fake person, right? If everything uh, 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 that's on the outside is bull and what, what makes a human a human, what makes me me, makes you you, etc., is what's on the inside, all of the stuff that other people can't see, then, you know, how real is it possible to make someone who doesn't have anything on the inside? In other words, a fictional character, right? Who is necessarily the sum total of the things that we see him do and hear him say. Um, so, so in terms of the, the ever popular question, uh, you know, did Shakespeare himself know that Hamlet uh, it was special, both the character and the play, right? You know, did, did, did he know he was writing, um, you know, that, that even though he was always good, that this particular play and more than that, this particular guy um, was special even by his own very high standards? Um, I think that he did. Uh, be, because, I mean, the, the on the first page that this guy, Prince Hamlet, even speaks. Um, he is he raising the question of how real is it possible to make a fake person? Um, so, so I think not only did uh, Shakespeare know that he was creating the uh, realist fake person uh, of all time, but that it, it, a good part of the point of the play for him was to do that. Uh, moving on. Um, Claudius then tries to uh, uh, prove with logic that Hamlet should not be sad anymore. Um, your father lost a father. That father lost, lost his. And the survivor bound in filial obligation for some term to do obsequious sorrow. Uh, but to persever an obstinate condolement is a cause of impious stubbornness. Tis unmanly grief shows a will most incorrect to heaven, a heart unfortified, mind impatient, and understanding simple and unschooled. Um, now, uh, with it being described in these terms, you know, you don't need me to explain to you how uh, absurd um, the idea of disproving someone else's emotion is, right? If someone feels a certain way, then that's how they feel. Uh, you, you you can do all the logical proofs in the world, and that feeling is sudden, is not going to suddenly go away. Um, and 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 the the way that Claudius is talking about this, as though there's nothing to emotions other than logic. Um, the survivor is bound in filial obligation for some term to do obsequious sorrow. Uh, obsequious meaning, uh, you know. Uh, requisite uh, by rote, the thing that you have to do that naturally follows, right? That S-E-Q-U root as in sequel, it naturally follows that you would be sad for a while, but now the uh, official amount of days that you were supposed to be sad is over. So poof, stop being sad. Um, so, so th this raises uh, another question that's going to come up again and again uh, in a play, I I the idea of um, what the uh, law, you know, do or uh, does or does not have power uh, over. Or even, uh, to use the language from uh, Act 1, Scene 1, uh, uh, loves versus duty, 
right? What's in our hearts versus what society says. Uh, that phrase at the very end of 1.1, needful in our loves, fitting our duty. Um, this speech raises the question of, well, there's mourning, which is, you know, official sadness. Uh, we, you know, have the flag at half mast for, you know, X number of days when a president dies, X number of days when a senator dies, X number of days when a mayor dies, or, or, or in medieval terms, you, you know, wear black for X number of days if your uh, father dies or if the king dies or in Hamlet's case, both. Um, but that's not the same thing as making a law about how long you're sad for. Uh, you can't make a law about that, right? Even uh, a, a, an absolute monarch, even a king with absolute power, um, can't make a law that says someone has to feel a certain way. He can make a law that says they have to pretend to, uh, as as in some you know dictatorships where people uh, do do the, these these elaborate uh, public displays of crying or whatever when when a, a, a dictator dies. Presumably, these are faked. Um, the idea of a law or a custom governing actual emotion uh, is absurd. Um, and uh, before leaving the room, uh, the king and queen, uh, uh, Hamlet's mom and his uncle slash stepdad, uh, prevail upon him to uh, stay with them there at, at Elsinore Castle rather than uh, uh, going back to, to college. Um, boy, are they going to be sorry they asked him to do that. Um, for your intent in going back to school in Wittenberg, it is most retrograde to our desire, the king says. Uh, and the queen backs him up. Let not thy mother lose her prayers. Hamlet, I pray thee stay with us, go not to Wittenberg. And Hamlet, being, I guess, too depressed to argue, uh, lets out a, a, a lame, uh, I shall in all my best obey you, madam. Shrugs, okay, what the heck, I'll stay here. Now, uh, a note on uh, where Hamlet goes to school, Wittenberg, the University of Wittenberg. Now, um, this is uh, one of the play's many anachronisms. Um, uh, Wittenberg had been uh, founded, the University of Wittenberg, only founded in 1502, less than 100 years before Shakespeare wrote the play. Uh, the play is set several hundred years earlier than that in the Middle Ages. So the idea of Hamlet or any, or Laertes or any of the other characters going away to college uh, as someone would today, is a huge anachronism. Um, and, and as far as why this school was picked uh, uh, at all, um, you know, Shakespeare didn't pick the name Wittenberg by accident. This would have uh, had an enormous significance uh, to Shakespeare's audience. Now, on the one hand, it was a good school, so it establishes that Hamlet is a smart guy, just as if you see a movie today and it's mentioned that a character goes to Harvard or Oxford or something. Um, but far more than that, uh, the audience would have had uh, uh, very anxious associations um, with, with what had gone on in Wittenberg. Uh, for those who don't know, it involved uh, nailing something to a door. Uh, Wittenberg was the home turf of Martin Luther. Uh, the guy who started the Protestant Reformation. He taught at the University of Wittenberg and the nailing of the 95 theses, or here's all the stuff that's wrong with the Catholic Church, uh, to the door was done in Wittenberg. Um, so if you're writing in the 1500s, you don't throw out the name Wittenberg just because you picked the name of a city out of a hat. Uh, Shakespeare would have known that this would have had huge associations for, for uh, any 16th century audience, especially an English one. Um, Protestant versus Catholic uh, had been a, literally a matter of life and death in England for quite some time now. Um, for those who don't know, England, uh, like most places in Europe, uh, was uh, for a long while Catholic. Um, when the, the Protestant Reformation uh, first gets going in the 1517 or whatever, uh, England uh, resists. Um, Henry VIII, in fact, writes some essay about how much Martin Luther sucks um, and uh, is rewarded by the Pope uh, for it with the title uh, Defender of the Faith. Uh, that, that's why, uh, to this day, uh, English monarchs are among us.
other titles referred faith. Uh, ironically, uh, the first one to be called such was uh, Henry VIII, who uh, very shortly thereafter would become the exact opposite of that when he decided uh, he wanted his divorce. Um, now, contrary to popular belief, uh, Henry VIII did not establish the church of England. He only appointed himself head of the church in England, uh, meaning uh, on British soil, he uh, his word outranked the popes, but he still saw himself as a Catholic and continued uh, uh, to crap on Martin Luther. Um, but uh, when Henry uh, uh, dies, uh, his... Uh, um, his, his son, uh, Edward the, the uh, Sixth, his son by his uh, uh, third wife, Jane Seymour, who was uh, a Protestant, uh, switches things um, and, and is uh, persecuting Catholics. He, uh, the boy King Edward suddenly dies. His big sister, Mary, uh, becomes queen. She's a Catholic. She rounds up and is executing Protestants. Uh, she was the... Uh, that she was the Bloody Mary of legend. That's why she was called that. She dies childless. Her sister, Elizabeth, who is Protestant, becomes queen uh, and everything uh, flips back around. So for, for the preceding um, oh, 60 years or so, everybody uh, in England had been uh, suddenly having to, to uh, swear on pain of death that they were a different religion from the religion that they said they were a few years ago. You know, Every, every few years as the monarchy went back and forth between uh, Catholic and Protestant and Church of England and whatever, um, all because of something that happened in Wittenberg. Uh, so I mean, probably, especially the older people uh, in the audience, people would have uh, jumped at the mere mention of Wittenberg. Uh, it, it was not something you threw out there lightly. Um, so th there's an odd uh, 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 century spanning uh, um, uh, uh, irony or, or, or uh, um, at least uh, something that does not fit with the way father and son, uh, King Hamlet and Prince Hamlet are presented here. In the last scene, we heard about King Hamlet as being a, you know, broadsword swinging, one-on-one uh, uh, -on -one fighting uh, you know, warrior king out of uh, a medieval legend. Um, but it, his son is away at college in Wittenberg, a, a, a um, modern, uh, it seems, intellectual. So um, when exactly does this play take place other than, quote unquote, the past? Um, it's, it's, it's unclear. Um Oh, uh, there's also, uh, as it happens, well, one of the many things uh, Catholics and Protestants disagreed about uh, in the 16th century was the nature of ghosts. Uh, uh, Protestant uh, teaching uh, was that ghosts were always bad. If you see a ghost, it's evil, no exceptions. Uh, Catholics taught, well, sometimes uh, ghosts are bad and sometimes they're good. Uh, there is such a thing as a good ghost um, who might be coming back to warn you about something. Uh, such things need to be decided on a ghost-by-ghost uh, -ghost basis. Um, so Shakespeare is almost like in, in a, a like a trolling sort of fashion, messing with his audience's religious beliefs here. Uh, you know, reminding us of what Protestant teaching was by invoking the name of Wittenberg. Um, uh, England being, uh, this is the tail end of the reign of Queen Elizabeth, so England being solidly Protestant by this time, um, the audience would know, we're supposed to believe ghosts are bad, but in the last scene there was a ghost who were probably supposed to think it, it was good because it was Hamlet's dad, and the play is set back before the Reformation in the Middle Ages when everyone was still Catholic, but you know, Protestantism teaches that Catholicism was wrong even back then. So our ghost, am I supposed to think the ghost is good or bad? You know, it, it um, would have been, I think, deliberately uh, 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 confusing, you know, e even to the point of, um, of it seeming even a little bit like satire, the, the sharper people in the audience kind of going, oh, I see what he's doing here. You know, he's, he's really trying to screw with the, religious beliefs of the, the people in the, uh, the cheap seats. Sorry. I, uh, realized that 
relative to the globe in the 1500s, I should be pointing down uh, to signify the cheap seats rather than, than up. Um, anyway, that's the point of Wittenberg. Uh, uh, the king and queen are happy that Hamlet's not going to go back there. In fact, the king is so happy that he uh, announces plans to get drunk. Uh, this gentle and unforced accord of Hamlet sits smiling to my heart, in grace whereof, no jocund health that Denmark drinks today, he says at line 125, but the great cannons the clouds shall tell and the king's rouse, the heavens shall brew it again. Um, he's referencing a custom called the king's rouse, where when the king was celebrating something, uh, he got drunk, and whenever he did a shot, they uh, shot off cannons to let everybody know that the king was drinking. Um We'll find out what Hamlet himself thinks of this custom in uh, Act 1, Scene 4. Um, but uh, for now, uh, everyone leaves, and Hamlet makes the first of his major soliloquies, uh, the, the speeches where he talks to himself, uh, the, oh, that this too, too solid flesh would melt speech. Um, oh, that this too, too solid flesh would melt, thaw, and resolve itself into a dew. Uh, in other words, uh, uh, you know, I, I wish I didn't have to be me or be a person at all anymore. You know, what's being talked about here is is what we would now call, you know, the, the disillusion of identity, right? It, Hamlet wants to be free of the burden of being a specific person, you know, and look how nicely this dovetails with the stuff that came up in the last scene um, about, you know, uh, is it not like the king as thou art to thyself or uh, so have I heard and do in part believe it, right? The extent to which identity is fragmentary rather than too, too solid. Uh, I mean, the, that double two there um, calling our, our flesh and therefore our identities too, too solid uh, is Hamlet almost begging the question. Uh or that the everlasting had not fixed his canon against self-slaughter. In other words, uh, if only God had made a rule that says uh, you can't kill yourself, that says suicide uh, is a sin. Uh, now, um, if you know one thing already uh, about this play, uh, it's probably that Hamlet's most famous speech, the to be or not to be speech from Act 3, Scene 1, is commonly held to be about whether or not to kill himself. And um, it, on one level, uh, can, can, can work that way, though it's about other and many more important things, too. More on that when we get up to Act 3, Scene 1. But as far as to be or not to be uh, being um, solely about suicide, it is interesting to note that in his very first soliloquy, all the way back here in Act 1, Scene 2, Hamlet uh, is... Expl it seems explicitly taking suicide off the table or, or, or that the everlasting had not fixed his canon against self-slaughter. Uh, in other words, I wish uh, God didn't say suicide is wrong because I'd like to kill myself, but he did. So that's that suicide is off the table. Um, Hamlet does appear to, to consider himself uh, to be uh, a very uh, religious guy. He is, is uh, uh, regularly and constantly concerned uh, with what uh, God does or doesn't want, uh, would or would not uh, approve of. Um, as far as this life goes, though, Hamlet uh, appears to be uh, have little use for it. Uh, how weary, stale, flat, and unprofitable seem to me all the uses of this world, he says. Fie on it, tis an unweeded garden that grows to seed. Things rank and gross in nature possess it merely. Uh, so uh, there's nothing, in other words, um, noble uh, or, or admirable or holy uh, about this world. Uh, anymore. Now, uh, whether he means that uh, this is all because, uh, you know, his father died and the whole world revolved around his dad, or just because, uh, you know, uh, 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 in this day and age, society is you know, not like it was in some, some idea of the past can be taken uh, either way. But then he gets more specific uh, about his problems. 
that it should come to this, but two months dead, nay, not so much, not two, so excellent a king. Oh, and this is a place where we can mark uh, how much time uh, has apparently gone by uh, uh, between Hamlet's father's death and the start of the play. Uh, now we find out uh, just a couple pages from now that the uh, guards and Horatio seeing the ghost was just last night. No time has elapsed uh, between uh, 1.1 and 1.2. Uh, so that would mean at the start of the play, uh, the king has been dead for not so much as two months. In other words, just under uh, two months. So what, six weeks, seven weeks, something like that. Um, as far as how much time passed between uh, the, the death of the king and the queen's remarriage to Claudius, the king's brother, um, that is less clear. Um, now, uh, uh, 1.2, the king's big speech at the beginning of this scene is sometimes staged as though it is basically the wedding reception, right? That they're coming straight from the ceremony and Gertrude still has a, a wedding dress on. Um, it can be done that way, um, but that would mean that, you know, six or so weeks went by in between the king's death and the remarriage. Um, if we want to uh, 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 share in um, and agree with Hamlet's extreme level of shock at how close uh, together the two events were, um, then we might imagine that the wedding uh, took place, also took place some number of weeks before the play uh, started. Uh, this, this scene is sometimes, as I've said, done as though it's right after the wedding, but it doesn't have to be done that way. That's an interpretation, not something that the text explicitly states. Uh, so excellent a king, so loving to my mother that he might not beteem the winds of heaven visit her face too roughly. Heaven and earth must I remember she should hang on him as if increase of appetite had grown by what it fed on. In other words, when my father was alive, my mother was constantly all over him, like she couldn't get enough of him. And yet within a month, a little month or ere those shoes were old with which she followed my poor father's body. Uh, married with my uncle. So, uh, well, we're told here uh, within a month. Um, now, whether Hamlet is exaggerating or whether he is explicitly stating that it was some weeks ago that the wedding took place, um, he exclaims that uh, a beast that wants discourse of reason would have mourned longer. Uh, in other words, even an animal uh, that's lost its mate uh, would, would have waited longer before remarrying or, or taking a new mate than my mother did. Um, so this association of uh, uh, specifically his mother, but, well, women generally, um, with uh, some idea of animal nature, we'll hear, unfortunately, more on this uh, from Hamlet. Uh, whatever uh, the prince's virtues, and they are many, uh, he, he is undeniably a very intelligent guy, uh, whatever we think of him uh, otherwise, and we uh, might have a, a some degree of sympathy for the odd position in which he finds himself, um, but he is not perfect, and one of the ways in which he is uh, most uh, imperfect um, uh, by, by uh, wide popular opinion, certainly uh, these days, is his uh, rather rampant misogyny. Uh, frailty thy name is woman, he famously exclaims in line 146. Um, now, uh, there's, uh, uh, he, he doesn't make any mention of any other woman having done anything so terrible except for his mother, um, but this is Shakespeare anticipating uh, an idea that would become standard in psychology when it was invented many centuries later, uh, that your, namely the idea that your uh, opinion of the parent of uh, uh, one gender um, uh, 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 affects your opinion of that gender generally, right? Um, now, even though Hamlet is uh, uh, an adult here, um, his exact age is not yet uh, stated, um, but we, we can see he's not a child. Um, so it, it's not a, a developmental uh, uh, negative opinion of his mother, but rather based on events that happened in his adulthood, but still, we see it 
poisoning his opinion uh, of all women, right? He does not exclaim, frailty, thy name is mom, uh, but rather, frailty, thy name is woman, right? My mom is bad, I'm mad at my mom, therefore, all women are bad, and I'm mad at all women. Um, now, uh, Hamlet is so mad, in fact, that he refers to uh, his mom's relationship with uh, Claudius as incest. Uh, most wicked speed to post with such dexterity to incestuous sheets. It is not, nor cannot come to good. Uh, he is technically um, wrong, of course. Uh, Gertrude and Claudius are not uh, blood. Um, she, she married her uh, dead husband's brother. Um, so they're not related to each other, except uh, by, by marriage. That may be uh, weird, uh, but it's not incest. So when Hamlet, um, uh, or the ghost, uh, come to think of it, spoilers, uh, both of them use the term incest for the relationship, though, though, though it is not. And speaking of uh, weird religious Easter eggs, um, uh, those among you who are more well-read uh, in scripture might be champing at the bit uh, to point out that not only uh, does the Bible uh, say that this is not incest? Um, uh, it says it's, uh, well, okay, and not just okay, but in fact, mandatory. There's some part, I forget where, that book is real long. Um, there's some part of the Bible, probably the first half, uh, that says um, a, a, uh, a woman actually has to marry uh, her dead husband's brother, or rather, other way around. Uh, a man must marry his dead brother's widow. Um, but only if they had, uh, they had no children. Uh, it says you, you have to marry your dead brother's wife, uh, have a son with her, and uh, name that son after your dead brother, if you, uh, your dead brother and the wife had no kids. So we have a weird Shakespeare presumably having that odd biblical stipulation in mind when he writes this, we do have uh, a son named after uh, the wife's first husband, but it's her son by that husband, and the brother marries her anyway. Um, I don't think any of the characters uh, have, have that bit of the Bible in mind. No one in the play ever cites it, um, but uh, Shakespeare could have expected certain members of his audience to be uh, familiar with it. Um, you know, if, if the Bible says you have to do this, if they have no kids, does that mean it's like wrong to do it if they do have one? And but it's, it's yet another place where he, he's, um, again, you imagine him with a, a smirk on his face, deliberately trying to create all of these little mini paradoxes that would screw with the heads of uh, the more religious uh, members of the audience. Anyway, uh, it's at that point that Horatio and the guards, Marcellus and Bernardo, uh, burst into the room to tell Hamlet uh, what they've seen, as they swore to do at the end of the, the previous scene. Um, uh, what, what in faith make you from Wittenberg, Hamlet asks. Uh, a truant disposition, Horatio responds. Um, I would not hear your enemy say so, nor shall you do my ear that violence to make a truster of your own report against yourself. I know you're no truant. Uh, Hamlet immediately uh, realizes that Horatio is just being polite uh, by saying, uh, oh, I just, you know, felt like st skipping school. I'm not here for any particular reason. Um, in that, that brief exchange, we see that Hamlet is, A, uh, very good at um, calling BS on things that other people say that are obviously BS, and also that he doesn't have much use for politeness, things that people say um, to be nice that aren't really true. Um, this is in keeping with his whole uh, seems, madam, nay it is, I know not seems, from a couple of pages ago. You know, with me, what's on the outside matches uh, what's on the inside. With everybody else in the world, not so much, but with me, it matches. Uh, now, uh, given that uh, uh, Hamlet does not appear to think much of the custom of the king's rouse in 1.4, we can assume uh, that his will teach you to drink deep ere you depart in line 175 is to be delivered ironically. Um, uh, 
though oh, you and me are going to do some drinking might be a, a logical thing that anyone else would say upon seeing uh, you know, their best friend from college turn up. Presumably Hamlet uh, means something more like, uh, oh, this king is such a drunk that you know, merely being in the palace is going to uh, teach you how to drink rather than, that, uh, rather than this being a serious suggestion that the two of them hit the bars. Um, Horatio admits, my lord, I came to see your father's funeral. Uh, Hamlet responds, I prithee do not mock me, fellow student. I think it was to see my mother's wedding, uh, making a joke about how uh, close the two events were to one another. Um, thrift, thrift, Horatio, the funeral baked meats did coldly furnish forth the marriage tables, he continues. Uh, in other words, uh, the two events were uh, so near each other that they were able to save money by serving uh, the leftovers from the funeral at the wedding. Thrift, Horatio, the funeral baked meats did coldly furnish forth the marriage tables. Um, now, that is a pretty funny joke for someone who is suicidally depressed. Uh, and, and that, like the series of puns he made when uh, he first spoke, uh, points to a, a one of the most fascinating things about uh, Hamlet's personality, uh, namely that even though he is uh, uh, the most famous depressed guy in the entire history of literature, he can't stop with the jokes. Um, almost everything he says um, is is at least you know a, a mildly amusing pun on some level, uh, and and in certain scenes, um, it's it, it's as though he's 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 doing stand up, just relentlessly joke 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 joke. Um, it's as though he he uh, you know has gone so far into depression that he you know comes out the other side of it where you know he makes jokes because everything is a joke to him uh, in other words he sees the complete uh, worthlessness and pointlessness of everything um, uh, Hamlet's line my father methinks I see my father gets Horatio and the guards' attention. They look at each other like, oh, has he already seen the ghost? Um, uh, Horatio rather cautiously asks, where, my lord? To which Hamlet responds, in my mind's eye, Horatio. So there's that uh, line about the mind's eye uh, again. Uh, we pointed out in 1.1 uh, how that was a term borrowed from religious philosophy, specifically from the writings of St. Augustine. Um, but here we see the, I suppose, transitional moment between uh, Augustine and Sigmund Freud uh, three centuries uh, after this, right? The idea of uh, seeing the father in the mind's eye, um, the, the, the idea that the conscience, or in Freudian terms, superego, is a permanent internalization of the father's voice. Um, you know, a, 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 in today's terms, we might, of course, be a bit less sexist and say the parent's voice. Um, but in, in Freud's time, it would have been the father who was the disciplinarian, uh, the one who did, did the, the, the punishing. So I guess it was uh, gendered for, for his society. Um, Horatio observes, I saw him once. He was a goodly king. Hamlet responds, I was a man. Take him for all in all. Uh, so that uh, um, distinction, again, with this, you know, loves versus duty thing, the personal and the social, right? He wasn't just a good king. He was a real man, uh, whether there was a crown on his head or not. Um, uh, they tell him, uh, my lord, I think I saw him yesternight. Saw who? My lord, the king, your father. Uh, Hamlet is uh, appropriately amazed. Uh, Horatio, starting around line 196, uh, explains that, you know, we've seen your dad's ghost in a full suit of armor uh, walking around. Hamlet asks, uh, did you not speak to it? Horatio explains that uh, they tried, but the, the ghost wouldn't say anything. Um, oh, uh, one of uh, the, the play's most amusing uh, anachronisms, um, when, when Hamlet makes them clarify uh, that the ghost was uh, armed uh, from head to foot. Hamlet asks, then saw you not his face? 
Meaning if he was in a full suit of armor, how'd you know it was my dad? Wouldn't, wouldn't the, the math, the visor have been down? Um, Horatio responds, oh yes, my lord, he wore his beaver up. Now, beaver, uh, in this case, doesn't actually mean he had uh, the world's second largest rodent on his head, um, but this was an uh, uh, anglicization of the French bivore, uh, the original term for the thing we've all seen in movies on the knight's helmet that goes up so you can see his face. Um, the thing on the hinges on a, a helm from a suit of armor. Now, this is wildly uh, anachronistic. Um, uh, helmets with bivores that you could lift up like that were not invented until hundreds of years uh, until after the play is set. But as with so many of the plays anachronisms, Shakespeare simply doesn't care. Um, he, I guess, thought it looked cooler to have uh, a ghost in a Renaissance uh, suit of armor than a medieval one, and so uh, uh, beavers up it is. Uh, they come to an agreement that Hamlet will uh, uh, meet them on the uh, uh, battlements uh, tonight to see whether the ghost uh, shows up again uh, and tells them not to tell anybody else uh, that they've been seeing his dad's ghost or, again, what appears to be his dad's ghost, since there's still some doubt. Uh, if you have hitherto concealed this sight, let it be tenable in your silence still, and whatsoever else shall happen tonight, give it an understanding but no tongue. Uh, no, no more words to anybody else about my dad's ghost. Um, and we get the duty and loves division again at the end of the second scene. Wow, Shakespeare really wanted us to have this on our minds. Um, they say, our duty to your honor. Hamlet responds, your loves as mine to you. Farewell. Um, in other words, they address him as, you know, their boss, the prince, our duty to your honor, and he stops them, eh, your loves, as mine to you. We're friends. That's more important than the fact that I'm the prince. Uh, and those closing four lines he gets uh, when he's by himself, uh, my father's spirit in arms, all is not well. I doubt some foul play. Uh, in other words, uh, I suspect the official explanation uh, of my father's death was not all it's uh, cracked up to be. Um, and yes, the term foul play is, as so many expressions, common expressions now are, is from this originally. Um, but uh, Hamlet supposes um, if there has in fact been foul play, then one way or another, uh, the, the, the guilty will be punished and the truth will come out. Um, foul deeds will rise, though all the earth o'erwhelm them to men's eyes or the rhyming uh, last two lines of, of 1.2. Foul deeds will rise, though all the earth overwhelm them to men's eyes. In other words, if somebody has done something bad, not saying who or what I think they did yet, but if somebody has done something bad, then even if the entire world uh, is standing in their way, somehow the truth will come out. Now, uh, although Hamlet does not mention God, um, we can take this, uh, uh, at least doesn't mention God in this speech, uh, we can take this as some sort of, of belief in divine justice, right? Though Hamlet has no use whatsoever for this life, fie on it, tis an unweeded garden that grows to seed, things rank and gross in nature possess it merely, he still appears at this very early point in the play um, to be an adherent to some idea of, uh, uh, you know, what, what we, what, Renaissance England certainly would not have called, but what we might today call karma, uh, right? The idea that, you know, the, the good somehow or other, uh, the good will be rewarded and the bad punished. Um, I suppose we all believe that uh, when we're young and then I, I suppose growing up, maturity is the process, the long and painful process uh, of it getting harder and harder to believe uh, that, that, uh, bad people always end up punished and good people always uh, end up rewarded. Uh, but at this early point in the play, uh, Hamlet uh, still seems to believe it. It'll get harder and harder for him to believe as the play continues, just as it gets harder and harder for all of us to believe as our lives continue. Um, it's another one of the great cumulative effects we're going to have uh, our eyes open for as the play continues. Hamlet uh, uh, changes so much over the course of it 
that even though the actual series of events uh, seem to take place over a period of about uh, oh, four-ish months um, from beginning to end of the play, uh, uh, Hamlet himself appears to be maturing through uh, an entire um, human life, philosophically speaking. Uh, more on that later. Uh, see you in the next vid for uh, 1.3.